Hi folks, welcome to Turbo Maple, where I answer language questions and fix my cars and do everything that's not cooking. If you uh, want to learn how to cook, go to my other channel, Maple Cook. Now, I started off YouTubing as a food YouTuber, doing recipes on the other channel. And, uh, well actually, this is the other channel, that's my main channel. But, I have a million different hobbies, and in real life, you know, I'll be honest, I'm a teacher. I teach language, and I speak seven languages, and I know how to fix cars, and blah 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 blah. So, I created this Turbo Maple channel as a place to dump all the other stuff that's not cooking. So, for all of you out there who have questions about other stuff, yeah, hit me with them and I will answer your questions. Today I've got a bunch of language learning questions that I'm going to answer while I eat breakfast. And if you want to know what this is and how to make it, go to Maple Cook and check out my wellness breakfast. Okay, so I'm going to pour the milk, get eating, and I'll answer those questions. Cheers, everybody. Mmm. Delicious. Okay, Nicholas, this is for you. Nis Nicholas asks, how do you learn to read and write characters first? By characters, I mean, um, I guess you mean written characters like kanji or hiragana in Japanese. Okay, or do you look up the most popular phrases and common everyday speech? To learn first. Okay, um, it really doesn't matter what order you do it in, you can do it either way. If you look at the way little kids learn, it's um, little kids will spend the first five years of their lives probably only functioning in an oral context. They'll speak to their parents back and forth, they will not know how to read and write. It's not until they get to elementary school, grade one maybe, when they will actually learn how to formally read and write. I think that's how most children in the world naturally learn. But you and I, as second, third, fourth language learners, we have the luxury of a more developed brain. So while we are interacting with people in a natural way, we can also be looking things up. There's no harm in doing that. Now, if you look at it the other way, like the way I learned French, yeah, that was done backwards. I learned everything on paper first, all the grammar rules. I learned it in a very sterile, very academic kind of way. And then I studied at university. Um, then I went to Quebec and interacted with people in a real life sense. Yeah, and I got fluent that way. It doesn't matter what order you do it in, as long as you get it all done eventually. So if you're the kind of person who is more suited to learning naturally, orally, and then doing it on paper, that works. Or you could do it backwards like I did my French. All roads lead to Rome. It doesn't matter what order you do it in. Okay, as for um, the question, do you look up the most popular phrases in everyday common speech to learn first? Well, you can. I'll let you know what I did in real life, okay? For example, when I lived in Japan, I ate a lot of curry because curry is the most popular food in Japan. A lot of people don't know that. Here, for example, is a brand of Japanese curry. Yes, it is Power Ranger curry. This is the type of place Japan is. I would make the curry. I'd be eating it just like you see me eating right now. And it's very true to life. I learn a lot when I'm eating things for language, and this is why I decided, yeah, I'll, I'll do it on camera too. All right, so I'd be eating, and I'd have the package in front of me like this. And yeah, just while you're eating, you got nothing else to do, so you might as well read something. And I would try my best. I'm talking about when I was a brand new learner, and I couldn't read a, I could only do the basics, right? And then I'd try to read it, and I'd see if you can make that out. Can you read that? Let's hope that's in focus. All right. Try to figure out that, oh, that's a name, Kare. I'd try to read the ingredient list, and I got, I remember the very day, too, I got to that word right there. Ninjin. Can you see that? N-I-N-J-I-N. Ninjin. I had no idea what Ninjin was. So, yeah, I put it down, and back in those days, this reveals how old I am, there was no internet. It was just paper dictionaries. Nobody to help me. I just looked it up in the dictionary. What the hell is a Ninjin? And I found out that meant carrot. Oh, okay. So now I know how to read and write and say carrot. And you just build it brick by brick. That's how I went through the day. And it works for everything too. I mean, consider this. When I was learning how to read and write Korean, I'd look at a package like this. And well, okay, there's a picture of corn. It's probably got something to do with corn. 
And, uh, you know, uh, by the time I had memorized the alphabet, more or less, it was fun. I'd actually pick up packages and read. Okay, I know easily now this is Oksusucha, but there's lots of little clues here and little fun little natural puzzles for you to figure that out. All right, it's Oksusu Cha. Oh, wait a second. Cha sounds like tea in Japanese, which is cha o cha. And it also sounds like tea in Chinese. Cha, yam cha. You got jomai ya, or you got yam cha, right? Cha is tea. So that made me think, oh, hey, this is a Japanese container of tea. And there's the Chinese character for tea, and guess how you pronounce that? That's cha. Oh, I'll bet you that that cha right there also means tea. And then you look it up and you find out, yeah, indeed, that is true. And you build it piece by piece. This, this is how I became literate. This is how I absorbed my language. If it works for me, it'll probably work for you. <sighs> okay, the next question. Um, do you listen to various foreign music to expand your vocabulary? Oh, hell yes. Music, anime, movies, dramas, any kind of media that you can consume, consume it. I've said to my students in the school many, many times, the magic word is more, M-O-R-E. I don't care what quality of material you're using. That's not the important part. It's the quantity that counts. Same with when a baby is born. It's not the fact that the baby is getting all kinds of quality input. It's the fact that the baby is immersed in the target language 24 seven for years. And then after about a year and a half or two years of that, then the baby starts to be able to express his or her desires and needs and inner thoughts. But before that, there's a lot of run up of just absorption, absorption, absorption of stuff in the environment. And babies are the best ones at learning language. Nobody else does a baby. We all know this. So if you want success, you imitate people who have success. That must make sense. So as an adult, of course, I try to emulate the style of learning of a baby as much as possible. So anything a baby would absorb, TV, radio, comic books, film, everything, I take that in too. So when it came time to learning, say, Japanese or Korean, I became a huge fan of J-pop and K-pop. I've been a K-pop fan for 20 years. When I started liking K-pop, size Gangnam style was way off in the future. That's how long I've been doing this. And you know what? Learning how to read and write Korean was the easiest free ride I ever had because of this. True story. I got my, my word lists of my English lettering and the Korean Hangul next to it. And I think I studied that for two hours. That's it. And I put the book down. I never picked it up again. But what happened after that was K-pop. I kept, I kept watching K-pop videos and K-pop videos back in the day, I don't know about so much now, but K-pop videos back in the day had subtitles across the screen. Everything the singer said was in letters at the bottom of the screen and that was wonderful. So I just naturally kind of observed it. And after a whole year, without having to try, I'll mention that, I'll underline that, I was not trying. I was just enjoying K-pop. So after a year of that, I went to go and shop at the Korean market and I started to realize, hey, I can read this stuff. I got out of my car and I said, oh, hey, furniture store, immigration help, uh, TV repair, supermarket. Hey, I can read Korean. And that's how that unfolded. Like I said, it was a free ride. It was the easiest thing I ever did only because I was consuming so much Korean media, and I've kept it up till today. I'm a proud fan of Blackpink and Twice and all of those, despite my age. But hey, life is supposed to be joyful. We know this. <sighs> Next question. How would you practice speaking and oral communication if no partner or people fluent in those languages are accessible? The answer is easier than you think. Babbling. You ever watched babies play like with their blocks or whatever in the corner by themselves? They babble. They will start to repeat whatever they've heard during the day. 
not because they're trying to communicate with somebody. They're just testing out their own voices. It's just the way babies are. And it's not useless, idiotic rambling. They're not crazy. They're just practicing their tongue motions so that they can better produce that language's sounds. Now, back when I was in university, our professor told us in one of the linguistics courses that I took that newborn babies after even uh, six months will start to make sounds that resemble the language of the country they're in. German babies will make German sounding babble. Japanese babies will make Japanese sounding babble. It's not fully formed language. All they're doing is just putting out whatever they can put out, making their mistakes, and over the course of years, they refine it and they refine it and they refine it. Now, those of you who know me in real life, you've heard me speak my various languages, you know, for the most part, I'm pretty accurate. <laughs> for the ones that I'm good at, it's because I've had so much exposure and I do this. Um, Yes, it is important to study. Yes, it is important to consume all of the media that I just talked about. But at the same time, when nobody's home, otherwise people will think you're crazy. But when nobody's home, babble. I do it too. I'll fully admit that. If you walked into my living room and heard me just living my life, you'd think I'm nuts. Well, no, you'd think I'm nuts regardless. But whatever, that's beside the point. When I'm learning somebody's language, I will be actually spewing out of my mouth things that I've heard during the day. When I have my Spanish running, my Spanish news running, let's say, while I'm having breakfast, and I hear the announcer say something that I've heard him say 10 times before, yeah, I'll actually try to say it myself. And I do that again and again and again. And this is how I improve, okay? I've done it for every single language that I'm good at. Now, I hear that there are programs on the net that will set you up with native speakers in different countries and you can have conversations with them. Do I recommend those for you? I cannot. For one, I've never used one of those things, so I don't know how effective they are for me. Secondly, the internet is a big place with a lot of crazy people. I don't know. I know that as an educator, I am not in a position to tell you to go and talk to strangers. That's just not wise. So I cannot recommend that kind of stuff. All I can tell you about is things that have actually happened. I have known people to go and seek out that kind of interaction and they have become fluent without having to go to the country. I'm not saying you should. I'm saying that this has happened. Okay, next question. Do you at times feel like no matter how much more you do, words won't stay memorized in your brain? Absolutely. If you are a born genius, yeah, you'll see something once and boom, it's in your head. I'm not a genius. Likely, you're not a genius. Most normal people will not have instant recall. Most normal people will not be able to take it and keep it forever. I see the brain as a, as a kind of bucket with a hole in it. And you keep pouring information in the top and a certain amount will keep leaking out the bottom. But as long as you keep pouring in more than you're leaking out, you'll be fine. I remember when I was first learning how to read Japanese script, right? And those of you who are new to Japanese you might not realize Japanese has three different scripts. It's got kanji with this Chinese character, which is Chinese characters here and here. It's got katakana, which is these really angular looking things. And it's got hiragana, which is these little squishy looking ones, these little soft roundy ones. I would memorize and memorize and memorize. And you know, that's not, that's only one part of the puzzle. It's not the only thing that's gonna get you across the finish line. In fact, if that's all you do, you will not cross the finish line. You need to combine that with using media and all the other babbling and all the other stuff that I talked about, okay? Um, I think that too many people put too much emphasis on just pure book study. Pure book study is only one part of it. And don't be discouraged if you forget half of the things or three quarters of the things that you study. It's not actually completely gone from your brain. It's still in the back. You just can't actually you can't access it. But over time, you'll start you're, you will start to remember that. Oh, hey, I studied that at one time. Or oh, that reminds me of something that I read. You know, it's all drops in the bucket. Last question: um, When you are practicing la musique de la langue, and for those of you who want to know what that means, that's French for the music of the language. Um, that's what I personally call the flow of each individual language. When you hear somebody speaking, let's say, at, a, um, at an airport, 
you might not understand what they're saying, but you can pick out languages. Hey, that's Portuguese, that's Spanish, that's Russian, that's Chinese. Because each individual language has its own particular way of flowing and way of sounding. I call that la musique de la langue. And it is important to master this if you want to sound natural and if you want to understand people naturally. Now the thing with Nicholas's question here is he says practicing la musique de la langue. That's the great thing about it. You don't really have to practice it. You just have to be exposed to it. Um, I will run movies a lot, like a loop them again and again and again in my home. Um, for example, here's one that I use for Spanish. It's called Perdona si te amo amor. And this guy has knocked over this girl off of her motor scooter. He knocks her off her motor scooter and then he says something. Did you catch that? He said, Ten cuidado, por favor. I learned how to say that from this movie. Not because I was specifically going out and trying to learn it. I just heard the movie run so many times that Ten cuidado, por favor stuck in my ear. That's how I work on my music de la langue. Okay, Nicholas, I hope I've helped you by answering your questions and uh, do hit me with more if and whenever you feel like it. And if you wanna learn how to cook, visit my other channel, Maple Cook. See you soon.